Our next speaker is Stephen Smoot. Stephen Smoot is a doctoral student in the Department of Semitic and Egyptian Languages and Literature at the Catholic University of America. He previously earned a master's degree from the University of Toronto in Near and Middle Eastern Civilizations with a concentration in Egyptology and bachelor's degrees from Brigham Young University in Ancient Near Eastern Studies with a concentration in Hebrew Bible and German Studies. Uh, his areas of academic study and research include the Hebrew Bible, Ancient Egypt, and Latter-day Saint Scripture and History. Uh, from 2015 to 2020, Stephen is a research association with Book of Mormon Central. He's currently a research associate, research associate with the B.H. Roberts Foundation. And of course, it's not in his bio, but we claim him because he started at FAIR many, many years ago, even before his, he went on his mission. So with that, we'll turn the time over to Stephen Smoot. Uh, thank you. Oh, let's see. Does this work? Here we go. Thank you, Scott, for that introduction. Um, I'm both very pleased and somewhat put out that I have to follow Dr. Carl Truman. Um, I'm pleased because he laid a lot of great groundwork for what I'm going to be discussing uh, in my paper today. Um, but I'm very displeased because uh, his talk was so excellent that I have to be the follow-up back to that, right? So uh, I apologize in advance that I will be nowhere as nearly engaging or fun or interesting as Dr. Truman was. Uh, but nevertheless, okay, great, we've got the slides. Let's see if this is working here. Yep, perfect. Um, nevertheless, uh, we will proceed. The account of the destruction of the sister cities Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19 has proven to be one of the most exegetically contested passages of Scripture. Couched in the Abraham narrative cycle of Genesis 12 through 25, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and the sin of Sodom, provoking the city's obliteration, has proven especially delicate, even distressing, for many modern readers who encounter the increasing visibility and acceptance of LGBT identity in mainstream culture. By way of quick parenthetical, uh, for this paper, I use the acronym LGBT as just a quick offhand descriptor uh, to speak of those persons who identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual, queer, or otherwise same-sex attracted with respect to sexual orientation. I exclude self-identifying transgender persons from present consideration since gender identity is a conceptually related but distinct phenomenon from sexual orientation. Uh, although I include the T in the acronym, this is simply for conventionality. Uh, I also appreciate that modern conventions uh, continue to further nuance these categories and labels, and that those within the LGBT community individually may prefer certain nomenclature. But it is not within the scope of my paper here uh, to parse these nuances. I am satisfied that the widely accepted acronym LGBT will suffice for my present purposes. Writing for a conservative evangelical Christian audience who grapples with questions and concerns about the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament, biblical scholar Tremper Longman III acknowledges that perhaps the most controversial issue among those raised about the Hebrew Bible has to do with sexuality, in particular homosexuality. Until the past few decades, the Bible was pretty much universally understood to prohibit sexual acti uh, homosexual activity, and even today, the vast majority of the global church holds to that view. However, some evangelical scholars in the Western church have reconsidered their opinion. Civil society recognizes same-sex marriages, and many churches, typically non-evangelical churches, uh, welcome openly gay people into membership and even the clergy. Longman's observation about the increasing tensions within the evangelical faith community over LGBT matters should strike a chord with members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who observe similar concerns rising within our own ranks. But why has the story of Sodom and Gomorrah caused so much contemporary angst? As Longman reminds us, Genesis 18, 20 through 21 speaks of a sin, a chathat, so outrageous on the part of the inhabitants of these two infamous cities that the Lord himself rhetorically signifies his own incredulity at the reports or the outcry, the tzakata, that he is hearing. This grievous sin ultimately justifies the utter destruction of the cities and their inhabitants. But what exactly is the sin of Sodom, Longman asks. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah over the years has often been cited as a text relevant to the issue of homosexuality. 
And so to many, the answer is obvious, and they point to the sexual nature of the sin, he answers. This understanding of the text was infamously captured in Jack Chick's 1989 sensationalistic comic tract, Doomtown, in which an evangelical Christian cameraman covering a gay rights rally for the news attempts to proselytize a young gay man by recounting to him the horrors of Sodom and its downfall. The tract ends with the ominous message, and I have it right there for you, that God destroyed an entire city because of the sin of homosexuality. As prevalent as this reading of the story might be among fundamentalist and ultra-conservative Christians, however, Longman urges us that we should not be too quick to jump to that answer. This final caveat is what I wish to explore in this paper. The thesis I offer here is that because Latter-day Saints, like other contemporary Christians, do not share the ancient Near Eastern cultural knowledge assumed by the biblical authors, they have often misunderstood the sin of Sodom in the book of Genesis to concern what we today call sexual orientation. As I will elaborate, this is an anachronistic reading of the story that misses the primary theological and moral point. My purpose is not to elaborate on sexuality in the Bible or the modern day, although some explicit discussion will be required to explain the Sodom narrative. Rather, I intend to demonstrate that the primary concern of the story is to model and contrast Abraham's hospitality and care for the stranger and the foreigner with the deliberate and extreme mistreatment of the stranger and the foreigner by the inhabitants of Sodom. The abusive sexual nature of the mistreatment in the ancient mind would have been subsumed under the crime of inhospitality. This reading may not be culturally logical for Latter-day Saints or other Christians today, but it accomplishes two important purposes. First, it accounts for the broader textual and cultural context of the story and explains why descriptions of it elsewhere in the Hebrew Bible do not explicitly associate the sin of Sodom with sexuality, but rather with pride, excessive food, and prosperous ease, and with failing to aid the poor and the needy. That's a quotation from Ezekiel 16. Second, it realigns perceptions of the story so that neither conservatives who misread it as a direct commentary on the modern notion of sexual orientation, nor progressives who misread it as having nothing whatsoever to do with sexuality, both find themselves having to rethink their approach. With this approach to the text, I thus hope to problematize these polarized and polemical readings of the narrative and redirect Latter-day Saint readers towards a positive application of care for the stranger and foreigner, as well as uh, care for their LGBT siblings in and out of the church. Uh, so in order to do this, we're going to have to talk a little bit about this topic of homosexual behavior and sexual orientation in the ancient Near East. Most Latter-day Saints living in the 21st century are probably at least somewhat familiar with the concept of sexual orientation. As explained by Latter-day Saint marriage, uh, licensed marriage and family therapist Ty Mansfield, given that we feel different kinds of sexual or romantic attraction toward different people for different reasons, and given that various attractions or even patterns of attraction may either change over time or remain more stable, the idea of sexual orientation refers to those patterns of attraction that tend to be persistent. As Mansfield elaborates, a variety of individual factors and experiences have influenced and shaped the nature of sexuality, sexual desire, and our personal sexual identity. And so the categories that are assumed under the concept of sexual orientation, such as straight, gay, bisexual, and potentially others, are not universally delineated amongst cultures and subcultures. What's more, in contemporary understanding, there is often, but not always, a distinction made between sexual orientation, how one orients their self-conceived identity relative to their sexual or romantic attractions, from sexual behavior, the pattern of behavior or habits that is enacted through sexual or romantic relationships. These and other factors play together in complicated ways as the individual constructs a personal identity which is why being gay or being straight are not scientific ideas, but rather, a cultural, or but rather cultural and philosophical ones addressing the subjective concept of identity. 
Although this all may seem straightforward and logical, it is, in fact, essentially an entirely modern construct. As scholars of the ancient Near East have pieced together how the ancients understood human sexuality, they have stressed two points. First, ancient Near Eastern cultures widely acknowledged and understood that homosexual behavior was a real phenomenon, but second, they did not really seem to imagine the existence of sexual orientations or identities the way we do today. In the ancient Near East, one cannot speak either of uniformal approval or uniformal disapproval of homosexual behavior, writes one scholar. Viewpoints varied among different population groups and during different periods of history. However, what does appear to be constant across the ancient Near East, across ancient Near Eastern societies, is that there was really not any sense that engaging in homosexual behavior made one a homosexual as a categorical identity. Writing in 1998, the Finnish theologian Martinissinen perceptively framed the problem thus. The essential question is how ancient texts, whether biblical or other, pertain to today's understanding of same-sex interaction. Mechanical paralleling of the modern and ancient worlds often results in distorted perspectives in which modern questions are carelessly put into the mouths of ancient speakers. Not only are the ancient sources culture bound, reflecting the values of their own environment, but so also are modern readers. To achieve a meaningful comparison and to avoid anachronism and ethnocentricity, it is necessary first to outline modern questions and then to see how these questions correlate with the old texts and their particular issues. Nissanen himself provides just such an analysis on Mesopotamian, Hebrew, and classical, that is, Greco-Roman sources, concluding after his study that the biblical material that relates to same-sex eroticism is sparse, scattered, and ambiguous. What the texts have in common is their negative attitude towards sexual contact between people of the same sex. Elaborating further, Nissanen explains how no single passage in the Bible actually offers a specifically formulated statement about same-sex eroticism. The topic appears as a secondary theme in a variety of contexts with different texts answering different questions. Because of this, Nissanen concludes, uh, he concludes that on its own, the Bible actually offers little in addressing the various factors that interplay with each other in the formation of sexual orientation in the modern sense. Quote, the image of homosexuality in the Bible and other ancient sources differs basically from modern images in that no distinction is made in the ancient sources between gender roles, man and woman, sexual orientation, homosexual, bisexual, heterosexual, and sexual practice. In those sources, Erotic sexual interaction on the part of people of the same sex is not considered a question of individual identity, but a question of social roles and behavior. Identity, like sexuality, is an abstraction that became conceptualized only in modern times. The biblical authors, like other ancient Jews, could obviously not think of homoerotic behavior as arising from any particular identity or orientation. This explains, among other things, why there is no word in Biblical Hebrew for homosexual, either as an adjective or a noun, and indeed why there is no citable example from the Bible of any individual, good or bad, who is so described. What the Hebrew Bible condemns as an abomination, or a to'eva, are acts of homosexual behavior between two men. However one understands the intent underlying this condemnation and its applicability to modern same-sex relationships, there remains the fact that it does not categorize the participants in these acts as homosexuals the way we might today. Richard B. Parkinson comes to a similar position in describing the ancient Egyptians, arguing that the Egyptians clearly recognized sexual behavior between members of the same sex, especially men, but that they never appear to have conceived of those who participated in this behavior as being gay. Textual evidence shows that Egypt did not witness any sense of categorization by sexuality, writes Parkinson, but that the sexual acts between men were acknowledged to occur. So besides acknowledging the lack of a concept like sexual orientation in the ancient Near East, it, uh, in order to best understand what is being depicted in Genesis 18 and 19, it is also important to know something about hospitality norms in the biblical world. The reason for this is because when most modern Western readers of the Bible think of hospitality, 
uh, they likely imagine not much more than being courteous to your house guests or putting up with the in-laws at Thanksgiving. This, however, misses what was a crucially important ancient Near Eastern social convention. As Latter-day Saint biblical scholar Ben Spackman explains, and we're going to hear from Ben tomorrow, so you definitely want to be here. He's great. Uh, the ancient Near East was a harsh environment. Consequently, extremely strong taboos and duties arose requiring that you provide for the traveler and outsider passing through your place of residence, be it your village, your city, your countryside, or in the case of Abraham, your pastoral lands. Hospitality was, as another scholar has written, one of the most highly praised virtues in antiquity. In nomadic societies, hospitality was an unwritten law, and the stranger was regarded as divinely protected. Typically, ancient hospitality included a host providing food, water, shelter, and protection to the stranger, defined as one who was outside of the immediate kinship or communal group, who in turn reciprocated by showing deference, loyalty, and graciousness back to the host for as long as they remained. This brought with it an unspoken but mutually understood structural hierarchy between the host and the guest. The stranger was basically subservient to and at the mercy of the host and lacked many of the privileges enjoyed by members of the host's communal or kinship group. However, being in the position of greater power, the host was burdened with enormous responsibility to ensure the needs of the stranger were met and to avoid any wanton disregard for what limited rights the stranger might claim. The visitor, for instance, might refuse some of the host's hospitable gestures, but this brought with it the risk of offending the host. Certainly, too, the stranger or visitor had rights to personal privacy as well as bodily autonomy and safety, which we'll see factors into the Sodom narrative. Um, reciprocity and mutuality was also an integral part of ancient hospitality norms. And if both the host and the guest played their roles well, the outcome would be mutually beneficial, since, on the one hand, it meant that the traveler had a greater chance of survival, while on the other hand, it lessened the instances of theft, raiding, and murder that might have occurred in the host's country or village. Showing proper hospitality and care for the stranger and alien could quite literally be a matter of life or death. Which is why Israel was commanded in the law of Moses not to abuse or neglect the needs of such persons in the land. Having themselves once been a vulnerable oppressed minority, ancient Israelites codified hospitality norms to make it a moral imperative that the safety of aliens was ensured. All of this cultural background must be kept in mind as we proceed to our reading of Genesis 18 through 19. Chapter 18 of the book of Genesis opens with Abraham being visited by three mysterious men who appear to him at his tent near the oaks of Mamre in Hebron. Upon seeing these men, whose identities are secret to Abraham, the patriarch immediately brings them under his hospitality by providing water for their feet and preparing food for their consumption. Despite his feigned modesty of wanting to, get to give his guests, his guests merely a little water and a little bread, Abraham turns around and urgently directs Sarah, his wife, to prepare cakes out of choice flour and commands a servant to dress a fatted calf. As Robert Alter has noted, it is precisely Abraham's outlandish effort to accommodate the strangers that has immortalized the patriarch as an exemplary dispenser of hospitality in the Western tradition. Uh, a, a quick little side note, when I was reading this text for a class of mine, our professor stopped as we discussed this and he said, uh, this isn't Abraham making coffee for the guests, he's preparing Thanksgiving dinner for the guests. That gives you a sense of how out of the way Abraham is going to accommodate them. Extending hospitality, writes Alter, is the primary act of civilized intercourse, and Abraham shines in the story for going above and beyond. After a brief exchange with the mysterious men, the narrative shifts focus towards Sodom, which has been looming in the scene ever since chapter 13 of Genesis when Lot and his family relocated there. It is here in the, words, in the Lord's words at verses 20 through 21 where a momentous pronouncement against Sodom and Gomorrah is made. 
How great is the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah, and how very grave is their sin. I must go down and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Afterwards, the mysterious men depart from Abraham and enter Sodom, leaving the patriarch behind to famously attempt his bargain with the Lord in a vain attempt to save the city. The opening, chapter, uh, the opening of chapter 19 of Genesis sees these men, now there's only two, and they're now identified as malachim, or angels, but not necessarily an otherworldly glorious type, just merely messenger is what it means. Uh, it finds them entering Sodom in the evening, setting a foreboding tone up for the scene and signaling the liminal, uncertain narrative space the reader is about to enter. Immediately, we encounter a perceptible contrast with the depiction of Abraham in the previous chapter. Whereas Abraham encountered the men in the middle of the day, with the blazing hot sun illuminating the scene, in Sodom, the men are greeted by Lot as the sun is setting, thereby literally and figuratively setting the sun on Sodom and foreshadowing its demise. The darkened atmosphere of the scene also evokes a sense of dread or apprehension absent in the previous chapter. Lot, like Abraham, offers his hospitality to the men, bidding them to enter his home for the night and, like Abraham, offering them food. Like Abraham, he offers them a little water and bread. But unlike Abraham, that is all he gives them. Missing are the fatted calf and other delicacies that Abraham brought out for his guests. Again, the contrast between the two figures is clear. Abraham goes overboard while Lot provides the bare minimum. Before the men could rest for long, however, the text narrates how the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house and demanded Lot surrender his guests to the mob. Their illicit purposes are made clear with what is now a notorious euphemism. Bring them out to us so that we may know them. Lot's equally notorious response to offer up his virgin daughters as a substitute for the Sodomites' ghastly intentions is rejected by the mob, who again demand the strangers and now begin to threaten Lot and his family directly. Suffice it to say, the morality of Lot's increasingly desperate actions could not stand in sharper contrast to those of Abraham's in the preceding chapter. The men of Sodom eventually attempt to force their way into Lot's house, an act of violence that the narrator uses effectively to ratchet up the tension of the scene and to show, the mob, to show that the mob means business. Whereas chapter 18 had passed in a scene of tranquil conversation between Abraham and the mysterious men, now the stage is jolted with violence and turmoil. At just this moment, the strangers reveal their identities to the characters within the story to Lot and his family, by striking the men of Sodom blind and warning Lot to flee the city, pronouncing, up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. In a farcical display of deep irony that highlights his folly, in contrast to Abraham's coy wisdom of the past chapter, Lot delays his escape, despite incredibly the impending destruction of the city, which the readers are now anticipating. So the angels are forced to drag him, his wife, and his two daughters out of the city, leaving behind the stubborn sons-in-law, who, like the rest of the wicked men of the city, are left to perish. The pericope ends in a terrible display of the Lord's fury, as was divinely promised. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire, uh, from the Lord, uh, so, excuse me, rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities, and all the plain, and all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. For good measure, in one of the most memorable moments in the Bible, the Lord turns Lot's wife into a pillar of salt when she looks back at the city. Where was Abraham during all of this? Keeping his safe distance by overlooking the Jordan Valley from Hebron, from which vantage point the valley looked like the smoke of a furnace. The concluding lines of the account enshrine both its moral and narrative climax. So it was that when God destroyed the cities of the plain, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had settled. <laughs>
With this story fresh in our minds, and with a bit of broader ancient Near Eastern cultural background, we can revisit the question of what was precisely the sin of Sodom. God destroyed the city of Sodom because of, it, because of the terrible things that were being done there. But what exactly were those things? As James L. Kugel reminds us, the biblical authors themselves answer this question differently. And I have here on the screen, you can compare Jeremiah 23 with Ezekiel 16. To say nothing of biblical interpreters since antiquity, who have gone back and forth on whether the sin was primarily sexual prolificancy, or rather pride or stinginess, and an unwillingness to help the unfortunate in this world. So if you're having trouble with understanding the story, don't feel too bad, because literally for 2,000 years, this has been a, a point of contention. In either case, there is little reason to argue with Nahum Sarna's succinct description of the sin of Sodom as a heinous moral and social corruption, an arrogant disregard of basic human rights, and a cynical insensitivity to the sufferings of others. Indeed, I believe my reading of the text offered here can satisfactorily harmonize these two interpretations. On the one hand is the sexual nature of the sin. This cannot and indeed should not be minimized by the reader of the text. As both historical and contemporary interpreters have stressed, an act of homosexual sex, or at least an intended act of such, was a clear component to the sin of Sodom. But what many interpreters, including Latter-day Saints, have failed to appreciate about the sexual component to the sin of Sodom is that it does not involve notions of sexual orientation, homosexual or otherwise, as such. The men of Sodom were not gay in even the remotest sense of contemporary LGBT identity, if for no other reason than the ancients did not share modern conceptions of sexual orientation. This point has been argued persuasively by Ken Stone in a recent exegesis of the passage now under consideration. Stone, along with other scholars such as Tikva Frymertensky, rightly recognizes that, to use indelicate but necessarily blunt language, the men of Sodom basically attempted to gang rape Lot's guests. The men of Sodom demanded access to Lot's guests in order to rape them, Stone writes. Although this demand contributes to the negative characterization of the city of Sodom as an evil place, any application of this characterization to contemporary forms of homosexuality ignores the connotations of same-sex sexual violence in the ancient world. Within that context, sexual penetration is understood not in terms of sexual orientation, but rather in terms of social submission. I hasten to add that this does not negate the fact that the Hebrew Bible elsewhere clearly deems homosexual acts as an abomination. The Mosaic Law condemns such acts, an attitude undoubtedly shared by the author of Genesis 18 and 19 and his ancient Israelite audience. The inherently degrading quality of same-sex intercourse in an ancient Israelite mindset plays a key role in the narrator's intent to elicit feelings of revulsion on the part of the ancient reader or hearer. The ancient Israelite audience for which this text was intended certainly would have agreed that the homosexual acts of the men of Sodom were wrong. And in that case, in that sense, the modern conservative Judeo-Christian understanding of this passage that recognizes homosexuality as sinful behavior matches up with the cultural assumptions of the author. Notwithstanding, we should not consider the city of Sodom to be filled with men who have same-sex attraction. Rather, these men wanted to humiliate their foreign visitors through a heinous act of sexual violence. This brings us to the second component of the sin of Sodom. As noted already, biblical texts responding to the Sodom narrative describe the guilt or avon of Sodom as being pride excess of food, and prosperous ease, and above all, failing to render aid to the poor and the needy. This failure to provide lots strangers the expected hospitality dictated by ancient Near Eastern custom, as explored earlier, was detected by the gospel evangelists, who quote Jesus as using the example of Sodom and, and his own condemnation of those who refuse to show hospitality and care for his disciples. But what precisely did this inhospitality look like? Here we see the interplay 
with the sexual component of the sin. The intention of the men of Sodom was nothing less than to violently rape Lot's guests, which is, to say the least, the antithesis of hospitality. It turns guests into victims and strips them of any honor and humanity. With such an appalling portrayal, the narrative graphically depicts the social and moral disintegration of Sodom. Crucial to this depiction of such a horrendous violation of hospitality norms and basic human decency is the utter depravity of the men of Sodom. The stress is entirely on the mob's horrible plans for mistreating the seemingly helpless visitors. Not just that they wanted to mistreat them, but the way in which they chose to mistreat them. The ancient audience of this text would thus have seen the abominable sexual acts of the men of Sodom as the culmination of gross inhospitality, not as sexual desire per se, and certainly not a signifier of any kind of underlying LGBT sexual orientation. This is to say that the sin of Sodom has both a non-sexual and a sexual component, but it is not focused on sexuality the way many contemporary readers lacking this ancient cultural context might otherwise assume. Attempts to reductively define the sin of Sodom as either concerning only homosexual acts or concerning only aggressive inhospitality towards visitors are thus both equally problematic. So the issues discussed in this paper are unavoidably sensitive, and I have spoken very frankly about what is depicted in the Sodom narrative. I have not done this to intentionally shock anybody, but rather to fully lay out what is and is not at stake with the moral and theological claims being made by the author of this account. I believe that it is important to take scripture seriously, even when it is uncomfortable, and does not easily resonate with modern sensitivities. It is imperative that we frankly confront this undeniably hard text and understand it to quote Nephi in plainness so that there is no misunderstanding. I hope that my exegesis of the text and analysis of the context has been helpful in that regard. But before I conclude, I wish to offer a few words on how we as Latter-day Saints today might liken this passage of scripture for our profit and learning as it pertains to present societal and cultural concerns. First, from my reading of this text, we find Abraham as a role model for righteous hospitality and care for the vulnerable. In this way, the patriarch can be seen as a type of Christ, as he selflessly sacrificed to ensure the needs of others, even strangers, before, uh, before, that they were met before his own. As Hugh Nibley has perceptively noted, Abraham is upheld both in the Hebrew Bible and in Restoration Scripture as a leading example of one who, through sacrifice and covenant, was able to secure the blessings of eternal life. The history of Abraham is a story of contrasts and extremes. If the meanness and inhospitality reach an all-time high in Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham holds the record for charity and hospitality. The patriarch's unhesitating concern for the well-being of, of the stranger and the foreigner can serve as a model for Latter-day Saints today who witness the displacement and forced migration of peoples in the wake of war, famine, or economic disorder. The example of Abraham thus very nicely complements Elder Patrick Kiernan's urging of, elders, of members of the church to be mindful of how they can reach out uh, and assist refugees and other displaced persons in a Christ-like way. In trying to untangle the vexatious issue confronting us of LGBT identity and expression in the contemporary church, Latter-day Saints should exercise the utmost caution not to carelessly brandish scriptural texts such as Genesis 19 in a misguided attempt to defend the church's position on the immorality of homosexual behavior. It does nobody any favors, not the church, not its moral teachings, not those who sincerely want to know how they can help and love their LGBT friends and family, and certainly not LGBT Latter-day Saints themselves, to misuse scripture and what might otherwise be a sincere attempt 
at balancing the two great commandments. As I have taken pains to demonstrate, the sin of Sodom does not pertain to sexual orientation as conceptualized today. The men of Sodom were not being gay, uh, excuse me, they were not sinful for being gay, but for attempting to commit an appalling crime, the humiliation of vulnerable foreign guests through an act of sexual violence. Despite the ugly caricature in Jack Chick's doom town, the men of Sodom are emphatically not representative of loving consensual same-sex couples today. To be clear, this is not to say that consensual homosexual behavior is therefore morally permissible in the eyes of God, but rather that the Sodom narrative is not useful in buttressing the Latter-day Saint doctrine of eternal marriage between heterosexual couples. Rather than misapply old proof texts, Latter-day Saints who seek to affirm and defend the church's teachings on marriage are better positioned to do so by grounding themselves in the teachings of modern prophets as captured effectively in the family proclamation and subsequent discourses by church leaders. When, when ministering to their LGBT friends and family members, members of the church would do well to heed the counsel of Elder M. Russell Ballard, I guess that's now President M. Russell Ballard, I should say, when he instructed, we need to listen to and understand what our LGBT brothers and sisters are feeling and experiencing. Certainly, we must do better than we have done in the past so that all members feel they have a spiritual home where, the, where their brothers and sisters love them and where they have a place to worship and serve the Lord. Listening to and understanding their LGBT siblings and offering them a spiritual home in the church of Jesus Christ cannot be accomplished by thoughtlessly resting scripture or by being more interested in winning an argument than trying to sincerely understand the plight of the gay Latter-day Saint. Consider then, in this light, the following way in which a Latter-day Saint today might liken the story of Sodom and Gomorrah to him or herself. Imagine that an LGBT Latter-day Saint comes seeking refuge and a spiritual home in the church. Imagine that this saint has endured feelings of loneliness and alienation in the church because they do not feel like they belong, or perhaps because they have regrettably endured bullying among their peers. Non-LGBT church members have a choice. They can, like Abraham, respond with love and work hard to help this weary traveler, or they can, like the men of Sodom, subject this poor soul to further abuse. Since the plainly obvious moral point of the story in Genesis is to praise Abraham's behavior and condemn the behavior of the men of Sodom, the choice should be very clear. Hopefully my analysis has shown that even difficult passages of scripture can be profitably applied to the faith of the saints when carefully interpreted. Although discomfort or unease with this text will undoubtedly linger, I nevertheless hope that I have provided an example of how Latter-day Saints can reclaim and reapply the hard sayings, or we might say in this case the hard narratives of scripture in a productive, worthwhile manner. In this case, the important truths taught by the story of Abraham and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah run much deeper than what might otherwise be detected with superficial or purposeful, purposefully polemical readings. Thank you very much. Oh, is it on? There we go. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you very much. Um, so I have some questions here people have sent in and says, Hello. There we, there we go. go. Great. Okay. How does the ancient expectation of hospitality inform the way we read ancient scripture about caring for the poor and the needy? Can we reach the same conclusion about its importance in our day? So we certainly can. And I, I hesitate to take this into a political realm. The reason I say that is because in the ancient world, hospitality was a political thing. Uh, I mentioned how the Law of Moses codified laws that the Israelites were expected uh, to abide in their treatment of strangers and aliens and foreigners and in providing them uh, necessary hospitality. So I don't want to necessarily give you know, definitive, here are political things we could do like the ancient Israelites did, um, but I think uh, in a sort of personal, if you want to call it like an application of the principle or in our day-to-day, -day, perhaps our day-to-day -day interactions, uh, we absolutely can 
understand how important hospitality was, and we can reapply it in our own situation. Um, in some ways, I, I, I think, as I mentioned, it's a Christ-like virtue. It's a Christ-like attribute. Uh, now, you know, we need to, of course, be sensible and reasonable in how we, you know, navigate this crazy world. But, you know, we should really think seriously that uh, part of the expectation God had on the ancient Israelites was to go out of the way to help the stranger, the foreigner, uh, the oppressed, and the downtrodden. So, what that looks like in each individual, uh, each individual's life, uh, and how that translates in their day-to-day -day interactions, I will leave to them to sort of figure out. And like I said, I'm not going to touch politics here or recommend, you know, policy changes or whatever. Um, but it's something that every Latter-day Saint should have at the forefront of their mind. Uh, I will refer everybody here to Elder Patrick Kieran's general conference talk that he gave some years ago that I mentioned uh, as maybe some additional guiding light for, for how to answer this question. Yeah, so, excellent. Yeah, uh, that's a fabulous talk. And I, I think it's, uh, well, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, here's another interesting question. Do you think Sodom would have been destroyed had their sin only been an hom uh, if they had their sin only been a hospitality matter, but not mingle with homosexuality? Great question. Um, it's one of those counterfactual questions where you kind of have to, you know, imagine circumstances that aren't present in the text, and so it's hard for me to say. Um, I, I I think that the way the author has, as I mentioned in my presentation, the way the author has, has narrated the story, it's, it's not just that they were inhospitable, but it's how they were inhospitable. I suspect that that is the really, what pushes it over the edge for why the city was totally obliterated, right? Um, I, I mean, far be it for me to question when God decides to destroy cities, right? But, you know, seems a little capricious to maybe say, oh, they were rude to the, you know, to the lots of guests, so we're going to obliterate them, right? Uh, I don't know. That's just kind of what strikes me offhand. But to answer that question, I suspect that it is both the inhospitality combined with the fact that it was a, an egregious sexual sin or sexual violence that they were trying to commit against these guests. That's what really tips it over the edge. It's horrific crime, yeah. really. It's really terrible. Can you comment on the historicity of Sodom and Gomorrah? Of the oh narrative? boy, oh boy. Well, okay. Um, I would have to go and relook at what the literature says on archeological excavations of the Jordan Plain, right? And what sort of cities uh, they may have uncovered there. Um, there. There very well may have been historical sites of Sodom and Gomorrah, historical cities in the region, uh, sometime in the Iron Age, right? Uh, that perhaps met some kind of calamity. Um, I don't think you can necessarily rule that out definitively, right? However, the, the point of the story is, well, on one point, the point is etiological. It's trying to provide an explanation for how the situation got here at the time that the author is composing the text, right? Um, and so, etiologies, the historicity of these sort of etiological stories can be rather dicey. Um, and so, I don't know if we want to necessarily hitch our wagon to that horse of the story must be absolutely historical in every aspect of regard, since I don't think that was the primary intention of the author. That's not the point. Right? That's not the point, exactly. Um, on the other hand, though, um, I, I accept, personally, I accept the historical reality of Abraham as a real historical person. I think that the accounts of him in Genesis have basically a kernel of historical reliability or truth to them. Um, and so I wouldn't fully, you know, dismiss historicity altogether. I would just say in this instance, it's perhaps not the most pertinent question uh, to try to understand what the story is trying to tell us. I apologize if that sounds like kind of a dodgy answer. It's not meant to be. It's just a really complicated issue with how you untangle uh, historicity with sort of the moral narrative that you're sort of getting and how much do we adjudicate to these different elements of the story. You compelling argued that homosexuality as an identity was foreign to ancient understanding. Does your exegesis have implications about the morality of homosexual acts today? Uh, as I, well, I will defer to the family proclamation on that okay. point. Um, I think that is, a, that is a, an entirely new subject uh, to tackle. Um, however, I personally am uh, very happy to sustain and uphold the family proclamation and what it teaches on this matter. Uh, that's my own personal position on the morality or immorality of homosexual behavior. Um, but whether, how we fold in concepts of identity and so forth, that, that's an entirely other issue to explore. But the baseline answer I would say is uh, I defer to the brethren and to the family proclamation uh, as to the morality of it all. One more. This one might be a tough one because I don't know if there's enough information here. You know, I, you know, I kind of opened myself up for this, uh, right, picking this did. topic, so, <laughs> so, you know, you know, we got to do what we got to do. It says, a Book of Mormon cross-reference to Ezekiel 16, 49, 5. I hope you have that all memorized, right? You oh, know exactly of course, it is. yeah. Is, is Helaman 412 with many of the same sins listed in the same order? Yep. 
And so just, there's no question or set. Oh. So if, there's, if you'd like to comment on that. That'd be... um, I would have to look at what Helaman, it's Helaman 412 is what Helaman it says Helaman 412. Yeah, I mean, I'd have to look it up again. Uh, well, I, obviously, I believe the Book of Mormon is an ancient record like the Bible is, and so it would not surprise me in the slightest if the ancient Nephites um, had similar ideas as the biblical authors had with, uh, you know, hospitality, caring for the stranger. But also, it wouldn't surprise me if the Book of Mormon authors, like the biblical authors, did not have a conception of sexual orientation like we do today. Uh, one, one, of my big stickler, one of my big sticking points I often read, try to get at is, um, I believe the Book of Mormon is ancient, I believe its people were ancient, therefore I expect them to behave and think like ancient people behave and think. And that includes, I believe, on these concepts that we just take for granted today, uh, notions of self and identity and things like that, that the Nephites may not necessarily have taken for granted or may have acknowledged. And so I, I would not be surprised if there's some interplay there between the biblical account and the Book of Mormon account. I would want to sit down and more carefully kind of, you know, parse through it and see what it's saying. Um, but yeah, I, I, I thank whoever sent that in for drawing my attention to it. It's something I'll definitely take a look at. Okay. And besides that, they had the Old Testament anyway, or parts of the Old That's Testament. That's right. When they That's came absolutely over. right. So they, so they probably would have at least generally been familiar with, the these, with these stories. Uh, with these concepts. Uh, if, if Nephi and his family are coming out of an Israelite setting, you know, uh, certainly they would have shared a lot of the same moral and cultural assumptions as the biblical authors, and so I could see that very easily being why we have the interplay there. Thank you very much for your time. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Scott. My pleasure. <laughs>